going to try to give a some fun introduction, quick introduction to the subject, and then talk about two papers from the last year. Both are with my student Ivan, and one of them is with also Scott Collier and Alex Block. So, uh, by way of introduction, let me start with a question. How much does low energy gravity know about its UV depletion? That's naively nothing, but of course we know that famously it knows a lot about its UV depletion. Uh, in particular, low energy gravity knows uh, the approximate density of states. It knows the thermal partition function. And one way of understanding that is through the method of given and Hawking, we use the Euclidean gravitational path integral. So when you calculate the path integral, so the, the story there is that you want to calculate a thermal partition function. To calculate this trace e to the minus beta h and form gravity, uh, you should put a boundary, put a boundary condition, which is a thermal circle uh, of some of length beta, and then you should find um, do the path integral over geometries that have that boundary condition. And there's a Euclidean solution, the Euclidean black hole which is a saddle point in that path integral, you can find the action, the on-shell action of that Euclidean black hole, and that computes for you the thermal partition function. Uh, well, that's good, but now let's square it. So when you, when you square it, so now we're just gonna follow the same rules and calculate the square of the thermal partition function. Um, so when you calculate the square of the part partition function, the usual rules of the Euclidean path integral tell you uh, that now you should have two thermal circles of size beta, and then you should do the gravitational path integral to that boundary condition. Uh, so there are some good there are some good contributions which are factorized, just two copies of, of uh, the ordinary black hole. That's an obvious solid point in this path integral. Uh, but there are potentially contributions from other topologies in the gravitational path integral uh, where the two boundaries are connected, topology is different like this. Now, from the point of view of gravity, that's fine, we're just following the rules, you, you impose the boundary conditions, and then you uh, do the gravitational path integral with those boundary conditions, and you get what you get. Uh, but if you wanna interpret this quantum mechanically, if you wanna interpret this as, as something like z times z, this just makes no sense. Uh, so we have to be very careful about interpreting higher topology contributions in the path integral, um, these higher topologies, uh, if you are not careful enough, well, they lead to what's called the factorization puzzle, which is uh, just this. And this is one version. But these are just numbers. Is it, it subleading? Sorry? Is it subleading? Uh, well, here I'm just trying to be very general about that there could be contributions like this. Um, the contributions that we'll talk about um, are subleading, but they're the leading connected term. I mean, having any connected term is inconsistent with quantum mechanics. Uh, so if there's any contribution like this, then uh, then you have a puzzle. And by squaring, you don't mean here you multiplying two things, because then one wouldn't think of drawing well, the diagram. Right? Well, on the left, I'm just multiplying two things, right. but that's the puzzle, is that uh, on the right, uh, the, the path integral, the, the rules of the path integral don't don't say that we're allowed to uh, fix the geometry. They just say we're allowed to fix the boundary conditions. So the boundary condition corresponding to two copies. Say we're if we're doing ADF-CFT, this is more more general. But say we're doing ADF-CFT. This is the uh, just applying ADF-CFT where the the holographic dual boundary theory is two copies of the CFT. The finite temperature. Then just the rules of ADF-CFT would tell you that. You could consider topologies like this. Now you might say, "Well, that's I don't I don't like that rule. Uh, I'm not going to do it that way, and I'm going to." But my rules of ADS-CFT are that I'm not going to include stuff like this. And I think, like ten years ago, that was the standard. And that was the standard resolution of the factorization puzzle. Was uh, well, wormholes seem bad, so uh, we probably shouldn't include them, uh, and they just don't really make sense. We're not going to. We're not. We're not going to include things like this in the path integral. Uh, but that that answer, well, we're not happy with that answer anymore. 
Uh, because there are situations where we know that you have to include wormholes, and they seem to be telling us something important. Uh, so uh, for one thing, replica wormholes, which are not quite like this, but are also higher topology solutions, are required uh, for the way we understand talking radiation and talking evaporation and information in black holes. Um, maybe more relevant to this to this pictures, these pictures I was just drawing, is uh, the beautiful interpretation of wormholes uh, in 2D gravity due to Sodcheck and Stanford. So uh, what they argued is that uh, there's a holographic duality for two-dimensional JT gravity. And the holographic dual of this theory is a random matrix theory with some zero plus one dimensions. Uh, like on the, basically this is the holographic dual. It lives on the zero plus one dimensional boundary of ADS2. Uh, now, this is fundamentally different, at least, uh, at least at first glance, this appears to be fundamentally different from other examples of ADS CFT. That's why it's so interesting. So just to understand the analogy gripping on. Yeah. In the first case, it's just because it's these two boundary conditions, so you have two boundaries, and then in principle you should scan the origin. So here are actually the same step. Yeah, these are actually in, in the, these are actually glued together. Yeah, so, um, it's right? so it's a bit different. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit different. Um, but there are, there are wormholes that are very similar to replica wormholes that were constructed by Douglas Stanford. Uh, they come about in a very similar way from the equations of motion and don't have the boundaries glued together. Uh, they just have some extra matter inserted. Uh, so it seems that that's kind of the puzzle. So what are the rules? What are you supposed to include? And how do you interpret them in various situations? Uh, no, I, I purposely didn't call it the factorization paradox or problem, as, as sometimes it's called. It's, it's, not, it's a puzzle. We need to understand what these geometries mean and how to interpret them. Can be done. You just have to be careful with it, with how you interpret it. Yeah. Uh, just one, one question. So, so this is related to how we should specify the contour for the gravitational part. Yes. Okay. Would you say that that is completely understood in this equality for the JT theory? Like no, the contour uh, is completely understood, and the, the classical saddles that uh, you know the, the trumpet and so on are you know the ones that you're supposed to pick up from the prescribed prescribed contour. Well, I, I don't know about all the non-perturbative effects. I mean, it's it's all orders in the genus expansion. It's yeah. totally understood what contour produces this duality. Mm -hmm. um, in general, yes, there's some prescription of contour. That that comes from the UV theory. We don't know how to do that, say, in, in 4D gravity. Um, that was one of the excuses people used 10 years ago to throw away the wormholes was, mm -hmm. oh, well, when we figure out the right con contour, it's not going to include wormholes. Yes. Right? Um, but, uh, well, they seem to mean something, so I don't think that's, I think that, that was probably, it's probably not a good idea to throw them away. They, they, have, important, they have important information to tell us. Uh, so, near, so in this case, the factor, so in the first case, factorization is, is not a problem because the boundaries are glued together. In the second case, uh, this evades the factorization problem in a very interesting way, which is that it's just not quantum mechanics. And in random matrix theory, the expectation value of the product of two partition functions does not factorize because the two copies get correlated by the by the average over random count of tokens. I'm sorry, just to make sure I understand the problem. So yeah. You're saying you, there are two contributions. One is, is disconnected, right? And the other is connected. Yes. So is the leading term still given by the disconnected part or in no way. It depends on exactly what observable we're talking about. For the ones that I drew here, the thermal partition function, yes, for this, the the uh, these, okay, I'm not, there might be some. So basically, some the, the, the it's generally sub leading. I'm I'm going to talk about cases where it's the only where it's the leading term. So, so look at the product of these at the large Lorentzian time. Yeah. Then then the trumpet uh, is larger than the product of the disks. If we, go to, if we go to the right kinematics, we can get it to that much. You say for one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the this uh, JT random matrix duality is in two dimensions. A lot of the wormholes that have been understood are in two dimensions, especially uh, these effects 
I would I think all the all the multi-boundary wormholes that we understand are in two dimensions. So uh, the starting point I, for this talk is the question: What about higher dimensions? Okay. So um, first of all, are there multi-boundary wormholes? Uh, well, yes, there are. Uh, there were some that were known long ago. This goes back to work of Malisay and Maus and Anthony Sitter. Um, I'm going to describe in this talk a new class of wormholes in, in higher dimensions. Um, and it, what's new about them is that the boundary is that they just have ordinary boundary conditions. So they're multi-boundary wormholes with just ordinary boundary conditions, and therefore they have to contribute uh, to, to uh, or the ordinary things we do, like an ADS. Secondly, what is their interpretation? Well, uh, the big picture here, and this um, is what's been uncovered I, in, in many papers over the last two years, so the story that's emerging, and uh, it still continues, is that wormholes encode some statistical properties of the UV completion. So exactly what statistical properties? Well, uh, I'm gonna discuss that in these examples, um, but, um, uh, important part of this is is what does it mean? So what does it mean to encode these statistical properties? Okay, so there's there's kind of two proposals on the table that we're going to talk about. Uh, one is that the correlations that you see, like in a two boundary uh, observable, like this double partition function, uh, is related to averaging over theories. This is the case in the JT random matrix duality. Uh, that random matrix theory is like an average over Hamiltonians. Um, and I'm going to describe uh, an example. I'm going to describe how 3D gravity can be viewed as averaging over two-dimensional CFTs. Uh, but um, you can also interpret wormholes in a fixed theory. Okay, so averaging is like a is like a technique that you can. It's a trick, a mathematical trick that you can do to learn about the statistics. Uh, but we'd also like to know about fixed, uh, particular. UV complete uh, theories without any ensemble averaging. And um, in that case, the uh, idea is that uh, wormholes encode some statistics by coarse graining over some uh, microstates. And making sense of that course, so there's, there's various proposals that have been made for along these lines, um, but I'm going to describe a, a specific case where we can really make sense of exactly what it means to coarse grain. Um, and exactly in what sense these wormholes are encoding uh, this, this course grain information. Is the so, expectation that this kind of independence of the UV completion? Okay. Um, you mean in this case of course grain over UV? Right. Um, For instance, in, in JT case, are we, is it necessary to think about JT gravity as some average theory? Because I may think about JT gravity coming from starting from from Fourier theory, looking at the extreme of black hole and the mean horizon region, roughly discussed by discussed by JT gravity, right? And where where averaging would come in that case? Um, well, I think I think that what I'll describe here will will also apply there. Although it's not I'm not talking about exactly the same type of wormhole. I'm going to be talking about on shell solutions, and most of that story is about off shell path intervals. Um, I would say that we don't exactly know. Okay, so we don't exactly know when. So you say you have some wormhole as a solution in the infrared theory. Um, we don't know for sure when it is the leading term in a given UV in a UV completion. Like one of the conditions for that to actually be a reliable leading mm -hmm. term in, in, U, in the UV completion, I, we don't know. Um, but I would say it's similar to the black hole entropy. In the sense that you find the black hole in the bulk, it tells you the um, density of states in the UV completion. Now it might it might give the wrong answer sometimes. So like it could be that in some particular UV completion, there's also a bunch of other states and maybe some black rings or something, and that the density of states is different from what you got from the black hole because there's extra stuff in the theory. There's lots of examples like that in string theory. Um, but it's, it's telling you one particular universal contribution, and um, then you have to look at individual theories and see if there's other stuff. Uh, do you think this only applies to wormholes, or do you mean other saddle points in general besides? Um, 
uh, which what the, what applies. The statement that encodes statistical properties of the information. I mean, for instance, uh, Herbal ADS versus the black hole. And well, I, those that also encodes statistical properties. That encodes the uh, entropy coarse grained over the microcanonical window. That's also a statistical property of the UV completion. Um, but that's like a so basically maybe I should have said it this way. So black hole, what we usually talk about in black holes, those are like the one point correlation of something, the one point, the one point average of something, like the density of states. And things with multiple boundaries or uh, higher topologies encode statistics that uh, are like higher point functions that, that measure something beyond the, the one point function, uh, say, of the spectrum. So those are the kinds of observables that are they're going to come in. But for instance, in, in that case, the long time average of correlation functions is correctly captured by summing these two contributions. So it's not really, I'm just wondering how you see the connection between that and these white holes. So what's what's kept correctly captured by? So, so in, in Juan's old paper on eternal black holes and ADS, ah, you have. Um, no, if you really want to get the right answer there, you have to in also include these handle wormholes that Phil Saw talked about. Uh, so that's another example where this same idea is true. Well, it depends on the dimension. But I mean, let's say in, in higher dimensional gravity, maybe that's five or something. Uh -huh. but I don't think we know how the wormholes would have to do. But yeah, I don't think we know how to. I don't think we know how to calculate reliably the late time two point function in that case. Certainly not. But but we know that there's a way to get the right long time average. That's what Wong Jo talked about. Just wondering if you see that as an example of this, or you really don't you think of that as a hook for the hook? I, I don't think we really know all the contributions, even in even to, even to the average. Uh, there's a couple contributions that we know, but there could be other ones like the ones that Phil talked about, and sure. I, I think we just don't know how to do that calculation. Uh, if we knew how to do it, then it would be an example of this. Okay, so you would include those as wormholes. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm getting. At. They're not literally wormholes, but you would include those as. Well, fills are literally wormholes. Yeah, I know. So I would just say one included the thermal ADS. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, all the saddles. You have to include all the saddles. <laughs> um, a lot of times, the interesting stuff is going to come from the wormholes. I, I haven't even really said exactly what observables we're going to talk about. So it sort of will depend on the details. But yeah, let me include all the saddles. Okay. So um, I, I think you, you don't really have to make you don't really have to choose between these. The, the, the same calculation can have an ensemble average interpretation and uh, calculate some coarse grained quantity in a fixed theory. That's that's fine. It's just two different ways of, of, of saying it, and I'll, I'll discuss both. So um, in this talk, I'm going to focus exclusively on solutions of the equations of motion. So these are saddle points in a gravitational path integral. Uh, a lot of the Higher topology things that have been discussed in two dimensions are off shell, because in that case, you can really just do the off shell path integral. Uh, and it makes sense to talk about those. In higher dimensions, uh, we don't know how to do that. There are a few contributions that uh, maybe we know how to calculate, but I'm just going to talk about solid points because that seems easier. I'm going to start with 3D gravity, but there are similar wormholes in higher than three dimensions, and I'll discuss those uh, after we do three dimensions and um, discuss the even the real world at the end. So let me start with uh, 3D gravity. So 3D gravity with a negative cosmological constant has lots of wormholes. Uh, a lot of these were 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 known uh, already. Um, some of these some a lot of these were known and written down explicitly. Some of them are 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 new in the sense that they hadn't exactly been written down in closed form or anything. Uh, but a lot, there are a lot of these solutions that had never been explained in ADS-CFT. And um, the conjecture that I want to describe and the evidence for it uh, is that these come, uh, that you can account for all these contributions quantitatively and get reproduce them from digital CFT. They come from an ensemble average over approximate solutions to the bootstrap equations of the 2D CFT. So usually in ADS CFT, we, we, we fix the particular CFT that solves the bootstrap equations. Uh, in this case, we're going to do something different. Um, we're going to just approximately uh, solve the equations and then 
um, define an ensemble. And by equations, you mean real equilibrium gravity, or you also look at the complex settles and fluid? Um, these are all real saddle points. If you, if you, okay, I, I haven't described what they are yet, but these, these are like operator insertions. You can move them off into Lorentzian and then calculate things in Lorentzian, but the starting point are, is always going to be a Euclidean saddle. I'm gonna I'm gonna define the, the ensemble in a second. Okay, so um, how do we do this? How do we average over CFTs? I'm gonna first explain how we average over CFTs, and then how that matches to these formal solutions in 3D gravity. So uh, there are a few things we we don't want to average over all possible CFTs. That that uh, that's not what we're looking for. We're just looking to average over CFTs that are plausibly holographic or that look reasonably like 3D gravity. So holographic CFTs in two dimensions have a large central charge, that's like large N, and a Cardi spectrum. The Cardi formula uh, reproduces the entropy of the three-dimensional black hole. So we already know roughly what the spectrum is. And our goal then is to define an ensemble of CFTs uh, with these features. Now there's something fundamentally different about averaging over CFT as compared to random matrix theory where you're averaging over, over quantum mechanics spheres. And that's the CFTs have locality. So uh, you can't, you, you have to impose locality as part of, somehow as part of the averaging. Um, and uh, in CFT, that means imposing uh, crossing invariance. So to set up this average, what we're gonna do is we're gonna average over the matrix elements of primary operators. These are the OP coefficients of the CFT. Um, this is just a list of numbers, which is data that defines the CFT. Now we're going to average over these numbers. And um, when we do that, we should really think of this more as averaging over approximate CFT data uh, rather than over full-blown CFTs. Because a, an individual draw from this ensemble uh, will just have some random set of OP coefficients, uh, and it will not satisfy locality. Wait, locality, you don't mean here bulk locality. Right? I mean, no, no, this is CFT locality, crossing. Mean, so by holographic CFT, you don't mean necessarily that it has bulk locality, locality right? You don't impose any gap condition. Right? I, I, we, we are going to impose a gap condition. So when I say Cardi spectrum, I, what I mean is that there's a gap and then there's a black hole. There could be a few states, a few light states. We allow for that. But basically, we're assuming it has a spectrum that's holographic. And you're imagining that the dimensions of these operators is held fixed. You in this ensemble. If you're changing it's, the CIJKs, then you're keeping the dimensions the same. Or? Um, yeah, at least approximately fixed. Although the the microscopic details of the spectrum won't matter; they could jitter around a bit. But they'll um, be approximately fixed. Okay. Just the CIJKs by themselves don't completely specify the theory. You also need to specify dimensions. Correct. But the, but if there's if you allow the dimensions to jitter around a bit uh -huh. in the ensemble, it won't affect the conclusions. Okay. It won't, that does, that won't even show up in the things that are calculated. Okay. Yes. Just to manage expectations. So uh, the classification of C equal one series is known completely, but beyond that, we don't really know to classify. So what expectation should I have when you say that you want to take a sub manifold of this? Part which I don't know to classify anyhow. So, uh, how fenced will it be? What? Well, we know very little about the answer to that question. We don't know even one example um, of of a of a CFT like this um, that doesn't have supersymmetry and, and low lying states. Um, for my purposes, it won't matter because of this. Because I'm averaging over CF over these OP coefficients. And I only need to know them approximately and statistically in order to define that average. So even if there is only like one holographic CFT, um, this procedure still makes sense. No, I'm if you had one is great. I'm worried about what's a measure. What is your measure if there's more than one? Ah, good. Okay, I'm, I'm going to define it in a second. It'll be an onslaught. Basically, I'm going to pick the, the simplest onslaughts that makes any sense and proceed, and it's going to work. That's the 
So um, the, the starting point is the eigenstate normalization hypothesis, which goes back to Deutsch and Cernicki. Um, and what they argued is that you can account for a lot of, uh, a lot of thermal properties of isolated quantum systems by treating matrix elements like this as Gaussian random variables. So I'm going to take that just as, a, as an ansatz that we're going to treat these as Gaussian random variables and uh, see what happens. Now, we have to solve the bootstrap equations. You can't just pick any old OP coefficients, matrix elements. You have to solve the bootstrap conditions. Um, so uh, we're going to assume they're Gaussian. These, these, these uh, matrix elements have zero mean, and they have um, some variance that I'll call C0 that is a function only of the conformal weights. So uh, this, is the, this is the ensemble average of the product of two OP coefficients, defining the bar by this equation. It says that this ensemble average uh, is this variance function um, times some indices to get the permutations. Now, uh, to determine the variance, we're going to use the bootstrap. Okay, so uh, the four-point functions have to satisfy a cross crossing condition, and uh, there's a natural guess for what these uh, should be in a holographic theory. I'm not going to go into the derivation, but um, there's a natural function that had already been written down in the literature that came from a bootstrap argument, um, and it's related to the uh, DOZZ structure constants of the Louisville CFT. So this is a known function. Uh, that's all that really matters for us. It's, this is some very complicated but known function. Um, and if you, if you make this on dots, then um, the four point functions will satisfy crossing symmetry uh, to leading order in uh, large C in this in the leading order approximation. Yeah. Symmetry in bodies. So you mean you mean that you evaluate it on non normalized body space, right? Because otherwise it doesn't have a hard space. Because the mean for the normalized body space are actually not mean space. So. No, actually good. It's a so no this is on the this is on the continuous part. This is on the normalizable part of the Louisville spectrum. But you should not think of this as being as saying that the theory is like Louisville. It's not that. The reason Louisville is showing up here is not because the CFT looks like Louisville. It's because Louisville is related to the Virasor algebra, and, and the CFT has the well, Virasor algebra. But it's not the unique point. I mean, for instance, the WCW model has a different function whose cause is symmetric on everything, and it's not in Louisville. So. That's true, but um, if you have a theory without null states, then what they showed in these papers is that this is the asymptotic formula for the OPE coefficients. So this is like the Cardi formula for OPE coefficients. It's the Cardi no, formula for you, H1, 2, and 3, we do not do it continuously. Um, the, so we're going to allow a small number of discrete states below the black hole threshold, and then we have and a continuum above the black hole even threshold. Even if those are not normalized for you. The discrete the, ones. Correct. Yes. In the Lugo sense, they're not yeah, normalizable. Yeah. They are normalizable in this CFT. So, yeah, because remember that that CDOV is not the uh, OP coefficient. It enters in the variance of the coefficient uh, of some random coefficients. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, not the, it's not the little c. It's like an average, it's some average version of, of the OP coefficient. Um, there's other differences here. So like in Louisville, Louisville only has scalars. And in Louisville, these would be the weights of the scalar. Uh, but we're talking about an ordinary CFT here. It has operators with a spin. And what's showing up here are the chiral weights. Uh, and so it's, it's not that there's a Louisville, there is no Louisville theory here. It's just that, solution. yeah, because it shows up as a, as a solution bootstrap, and then you can use it to, to find this function. And we'll see some normalization of the light. Sorry? We're all, we're all yeah. These are the Cardi, these are Cardi density of states. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the definition of the ensemble. That's the whole that's the whole definition of the ensemble. So that's how that's what we mean by averaging over CFTs. And then the conjecture is that all of the classical solutions of three D gravity plus point particles, including these wormholes that I'm 
that I drew and we'll talk about, match CFT calculations in this ensemble, uh, including loops, although we've only checked one loop. Couple comments. First of all, I said nothing about energy level statistics. The energy level statistics have been important for <coughs> considering, so for, for discussions of the, the partition function squared. Um, but these classical use Euclidean saddles that I'm going to talk about don't care about energy level statistics. They only care about the OPD statistics. The second comment is that this definition of the ensemble is not, you should not think of this as the exact ensemble. This is a leading order thing, which you then have to uh, plug in and solve crossing order by order systematically in some expansion. We know how to do that in some cases, like in order to calculate the next the subleading terms in the ensemble and their non-Gaussian contributions there. You have to calculate them order by order. We, we only know how to do it case by case, but in the cases where we know how to do it, that also matches uh, higher topology solutions that you get in 3D gap. And again, the information that is local CFT, I mean, there's energy momentum tensor and elsewhere in this, just in the card. Yeah, well, the fact that we have Virasoro, um, so that the, this formula, came from bootstrapping Virasoro blocks. So there's a stress tensor built into it. So that's all. Yeah, yeah. Somehow the thing that's fueling your wormholes is the correlation between the eigenstates rather than the values. Like it's some randomness in the yes. eigenstates and not in the eigenvalues. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, the wave functions. Yeah. That's how they phrase ETH too. It's the, the wave functions themselves are sort of random. Yeah. So let me give a quick CFT example, CFT calculation. I'm just gonna sketch this, this briefly. Because the, the CFT calculations are actually really easy um, once you have the ensemble set up. The gravity calculations are sort of sort of hard, but the CFT calculations are easy. So like let's look at the example of a product of two four-point functions. This is the kind of thing that we want to calculate be able to calculate the average of. Okay, so we have one, we have two copies of the CFT and we want to calculate the product of a four point function times another four point function, possibly at different cross ratios. First step, expand in conformal blocks. Okay, so you can take any CFT four point function and expand it in conformal blocks. I called one of them the sum over primaries P and the other one is the sum over primaries Q. And then I just put them all into one big sum. The expansion in conformal blocks has OP coefficients, and then it has the conformal blocks, which are some um, ugly special functions. So you write down this conformal block expansion, and then you do the average over the ensemble the way that I defined. That is, uh, if you now want to calculate the average of this product of four-point functions, you just take the average of this expression. Um, and I've told you that these are Gaussian random variables, uh, and I've given you their variance, so I've told you everything you need to know now to, to calculate this average. So you would you would take the variance I gave you and, and plug it into this sum, approximate the sum by an integral, um, and that's your answer. So, yeah. So you said you allow some discrete states below the black hole threshold. So when yeah, you he, here I'm here I'm I'm not going to include those yet. Those will be subleading contributions. How do you in fact, that? I'm not going to include them in the in the talk. Um, how do I know? SW, how do you know? Um, uh, well, put it this way, those are, other, they're, they're different contributions that you can include systematically. I'm just not gonna include them yet. We, we can add them in later. Although I, I won't in the talk, but we did. <laughs> <laughs> we did in the paper. <laughs> Somebody you mean what? Um, uh, let's see. So let me let me let me take that back. So they're 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 subleading in the sense of the there's some expansion that defines how you do how you define that defines the ensemble. Okay, so the leading the leading contribution of the ensemble is you just declare that there's a Gaussian OP coefficients and, and only black holes. Is it law risky expansion or something? Uh, no, it's more complicated than that because things are non-perturbatively suppressed in C and which ones dominate down the kinematics and everything. Yeah, 
um, doesn't it, shouldn't your answer depend on the dimensions of one supreme court, whether the the, the life suffrages will be important or not? Um, uh, and the kinematics, I guess. Yeah, it depends on the kinematics. Um, Yeah, I don't, it, it, whether they're, let me take back the statement that they're subleading. It's, they're not necessarily subleading. It depends on the details. Um, but that's another contribution that can be included separately and it just gives another term. And it corresponds to a different wormhole than the one that I'm gonna talk about here. Um, but here one, two, three, four are heavy operators above the, the black hole threshold. So, um, no. Okay. So these, the, think of these as as probe operators that are below the black hole threshold. So there's some we've so we've taken a, a CFT that just has black hole states above threshold, and it has four operators which are um, so, which are below the black hole threshold but heavy enough to back react. So the connection is much larger than one. It's larger than. C. Um, it's it's of order C, but less than C over 12. So if you act, if you if you plug in those formulas that I gave for the ensemble, um, something something of a miracle occurs in this calculation, which is that the all those like Louisville factors and and the Carney density of states and everything they conspire to make a Louisville correlation function. So the answer. So this average calculation is that on the, on, so on the left hand side where we have think of this as the boundary CFT you have two copies of the CFT four point function and you want to calculate its average and with this in this ensemble there's a connected contribution which is a product of two Louisville correlation functions. So how, how, how to Yeah, so so the, the you can't calculate either side of this equation, but you can show that they're equal. Okay, that's, that's my question. Because uh, we so we know how to write the Louisville four point function as a as integral, integral yeah. over conformal blocks times C zeros. Okay. And that's exactly what happens when you do the average here is you get that expression. But is it numerical? Given the assumption that you took the average from Louisville. The, the miracle is that the row zeros work out this way. Uh -huh. There were all these prefactors. So that's the, the only miracle here is that those work out this way. If you consider like a product of, of three four point functions, that doesn't happen and you don't end up with, and you don't end up with Louisville. Mm -hmm. um, you end up with something else. Which Louisville do you end up with? What, what's coefficient in the exponent that you get? The central charge matches that of the uh, holographic CFT. So it's a large central charge to the building. Yeah. Are, are you going to make a comment about what happens if you expand the two four point functions in different channels? No. Okay. But the uh, answer is that that um, requires non Gaussian. That, that can be used to calculate some non Gaussian terms in the ensemble. Uh, the, the ensemble that I, that I wrote is insufficient to reproduce that calculation. So it's just like this Lewis X answer plus something else that you write that, right? Um, like plus the discrete piece. That you oh, that's right. Project. That's right. This is the contribution of the heavy states oh, running in that in that opening. <laughs> um, so two things to note. First of all, the right hand side does not factorize. It kind of looks like the left hand side, but it's not. You have to look carefully. So the on the left hand side, there's an x x bar in this one. Um, and then x prime, x bar prime in, the, in this one. And on the right hand sides, they got mixed up. It's like G Louisville of x, x prime. And in particular, x prime is not the complex conjugate of x. So although we started with a CFT uh, four point function in, in Euclidean signature, this is a Louisville correlation function in Lorentzian signature. So it's not that it's factorizing. Um, the second comment is that. Uh, general multi CFT averages observables like this, the calculation is similar, the CFT calculations are always fairly straight, straightforward at leading order. 
In general, the answer is not Louisville, because as I said, this miracle with, with the density of states doesn't occur. Okay. So let me go now to the uh, whole theory. That's, that's a CFT calculation. I've described how to calculate an average in this ensemble uh, of that observable. And now I'm going to match that to a, a bulk calculation. The bulk theory is simple. It's just 3D gravity plus massive point particles. So the action is just the usual gravity action and then some world line contributions from the point particles. I think we could do quantum fields, but things are going to be more complicated because then we'd have to talk about Witten diagrams instead of uh, just talking about classical solutions. So the, the solutions of this theory are completely classified because it has to be locally uh, hyperbolic. And therefore, all the solutions in principle, in principle, here's the list of solutions. It's 3D hyper hyperbolic local fields. That's all the, all the classical solutions of this theory. And these things can get extremely complicated. Um, and it's only the simplest ones that you can really write down and, and so write their metrics and analyze them in detail. Uh, so this has all the usual like single boundary solutions that we like to talk about in ABS CFT and old black holes, uh, et cetera. But it also has multi boundary solutions. And uh, an interesting class of, of two boundary solutions was studied by Madison and Maus. Um, so this is what the solutions look like. Um, so it's a hyperbolic two manifold. It has the topology of a hyperbolic two manifold times an integral. Okay, so this is a this is a three dimensional wormhole. You should think of the uh, horizontal as the radial direction of ADS CFT. So there's one boundary over here, and then there's a second asymptotic boundary. So it's a Euclidean it's a Euclidean ADS solution with two asymptotic boundaries, and uh, the metric is really easy to write down. It just looks like this with rho the radial direction. And you can also easily check that this satisfies the Einstein equations whenever the two manifold is hyperbolic. A two manifold can be hyperbolic as long as it's high enough genus or has enough insertions on it. So that's why I drew here a genus two example. Um, now, since this has to be a hyperbolic orbifold, you can, you can get it from, from quotients of, of H3, but that won't really be important. Um, is it important if these geometries are stable in the sense of not having negative properties? It might be important. We don't know whether they're stable. Um, we don't even, I, I would say that we don't even know exactly what the rules are for determining whether they're stable. Are we supposed to talk about the instantons and what exactly, are, what exactly is allowed? So we don't know. Um, I'm not going to check stability. I would say that if we find a mean, if we find a reasonable interpretation in ADS CFT, then uh, that suggests that they're meaningful. But um, we don't really know. Okay, so there are lots of solutions that you could write down like this. I want to talk about this example where we did the calculation on the CFT side. Okay, so we talked about calculating the, the product of two, four point, two CFT four-point functions. This has a wormhole uh, that matches that calculation. Okay, so the details of this wormhole won't be too important, but I want to draw the picture. OK, so this is a picture of the wormhole. Um, again, this is a Euclidean ADS solution uh, with two asymptotic boundaries. You can think of this as sort of like a, a higher boundary version of a Witten diagram. So we have a, a four, we have four points inserted on the left, we have four points inserted on the right, and then there's some Witten diagram. Now the particles are very massive, so the Witten diagram backreacts. It's not just an ordinary one, uh, but you can backreact it completely, and you can find the metric on this on this geometry. It has uh, four particles traversing through the wormhole um, and solves the equation of motion. You can't quite write it down in closed form. Um, but you can almost write it down in closed form. That's what this metric is. The only thing that's, that's not in closed form is that you need a, uh, there's actually a Louisville field as an onsat. So this onsat has a Louisville field in it that satisfies 
Google equation. You can so solve the Google, Google equation. Efficient one which sits before phi is some function of C, you tell me? Well, this is the rescaled classical Louisville field, so the C's have been absorbed into it. Uh, but you're saying in the Louisville action? Yes. Well, I, 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 there will be, yeah, when we calculate the Louisville action, the coefficient will be the central charge, the large C central charge. So we calculated the gravitational action of these solutions, and um, the answer is a Louisville action. And so, so it works for these. It works for all two boundary groups, all two boundary wormholes. Like these, these two boundary wormholes with a bunch of uh, particles traveling through them. It works for stuff that's like higher genus or higher genus plus particles traveling through them. Any of these two boundary wormholes like this. Uh, the gravitational action factorizes or, or splits into these two Louisville actions. When you say Louisville action, you also have contribution of Hermann Fortier, so like central charge minus phi as well on the central charge. Um, it's okay because in your, in your answer to the remember you have this into the phi and into the minus phi and into this one, this y by the factor. And Louisville action of the quantity 11, you have also this the minus phi. Yeah, the, those are subleading R C and are not are not included in this formula. Yeah. And the this Louisville action is the one of Cartesian in company, the one that needs extra data besides the two-dimensional data to find. No. Well, okay, it agrees with them because we use their results partly in getting this formula. But for if you just have two boundaries, this is literally the Louisville action of the Louisville CFT. It's, it's, you don't need any of this extra data that, that they need. Um, there's one funny thing about it, which is that it's being evaluated at, at uh, moduli, which are not, complex con are not complex conjugates of each other. So there's some analytic continuation involved, but it's really the ordinary, it's the true Louisville action of the Louisville CFT. Yeah, because in 15, with the uh, with canonical pure gravity, right, in, in, in analysis, but we actually saw something like that when computing the, uh, say, the overlap of uh, wave functions and uh, the, uh, say, topology changing, because we also had this phenomenon in which this, the UV had to be, well, in which the S gravitational uh, divided into the sum of two UVs, uh, okay. the boundaries, okay. with the uh, interchange model. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think we're talking. I think the solutions that you were talking about are quite similar to the ones that we're talking about here. Um, the observable is slightly different because I think you were in. It's, there's a Lorentzian versus Euclidean, and exactly what the boundary conditions are. But the solutions are very similar to the ones that you were talking about. Okay, so the so the gravitational action is related to Louisville. The punchline then is that the gravitational action of the wormhole agrees exactly with the uh, ensemble CFT average. You calculate the, you can calculate these averages in conformal field theory, and that agrees with e to the minus s wormhole. This works for all of the uh, two boundary wormholes with any genus, any number of particles, and we've also matched the one with corrections around this. So one of the corrections on the gravity side, then why don't you have to worry about this instability issue that you can't replace? The one loop graviton determinant is the you can just calculate the you can calculate the determinant. So there's no there's no matter. This is just no. these are, these are ah, the right. gravitons. Yeah, the, this is just the graviton one loop. There's no matter fields, they're just the matter particles. Right. Okay. And what do you mean by one loop on the CFT side then in this case? Uh, it's like so there's an e to the c um, term and then and then the prefactor is the one loop. So um, on, it just means that we take that that onzots and okay. check the prefactors in this equation as well as the exponent. Okay. So the exponent agrees and the prefactor agrees. So the, 
so I've described some class of these wormholes. Um, there, are, there, there are various other wormholes and more complicated wormholes that we could talk about. I'm going to mention just one other one, which are the handles. So handles means uh, single boundary wormholes, things that look like this. Now, this picture I'm drawing is, is a two-dimensional handle. Uh, you have to imagine a, a three-dimensional handle. So it's a little, you just have to think about it, but there's a, there's a, there's a three-dimensional version of this picture, which um, is what I really mean here. So there's a three geometry where things go through a tube and you have a higher topology, but there's just a single ADS boundary. Things like this also perfectly match the calculations in the CFT ensemble. So since people were asking me about, um, I wasn't really going to go into it, but since people are asking about including the light states in the conformal block expansion, um, that's what these geometries, that's what these geometries do. Is um, so like this one, if you calculate a four-point function of these four operators, it includes this additional light state in uh, that conformal block expansion. <coughs> Does it still remain non-factorizable? The, the product of two-point function. Like average of the product of two point functions, or so when you include these light states, or is it somehow? Uh, yeah, it's still not, it's, it's, it's still has connected contributions. It doesn't make a contribution. Okay. Really is an ensemble average, so that's what we're discussing. Yep, there's a choice, right? You can choose the light state, like which light states you may use, right? Uh, yeah, so the light states, um, we just include some small, just some small list of light states. Um, and then all these statistical formulas that I gave you, like in terms of the OP coefficients, we just apply them also, assume that those, for, assume those formulas are also true for the light states. In that sense, it still this agrees with the, the, the wormhole that you get in the board. These handle wormholes have some interesting implications. Um, there these, there's this old work of Coleman and Giddings and Schominger arguing that when you have wormholes like this, it induces random coupling constants in the bulk effective field theory. And uh, we do see an effect like this uh, occurring from these wormholes. You can calculate uh, the contribution to, of these to the bulk effective theory, and, and there's, there's basically a random three-point function in the bulk. Uh, another application is that you can see, you can calculate violations of global symmetries from these gravitational instantons. So uh, like if I, if I take one of these particles to be charged uh, under a global symmetry, then um, if you interpret this as an amplitude, the wormhole can sort of eat up the charge and um, you, can, you can violate, you can calculate that, that violation to the, to the global symmetry. Um, okay, in the last five minutes or so, I want to discuss um, going beyond this large C ensemble. So, uh, so far I've talked only about 3D wormholes and argued that that's a match to these average over 2D CFTs. Uh, now, depending on how far we can get in five minutes, um, I'm going to talk about higher dimensions, including four dimensions, um, and how to interpret these in a fixed UV complete field. There's only two slides in this. <laughs> so um, first of all, there are similar wormhole solutions in higher dimensions. Maybe that's the main, maybe that's the main takeaway message for this, this part of the talk is that there are solutions. You can write them down. Uh, you can solve the equations of motion uh, in great detail by assuming spherical symmetry. Okay, so this is a picture of a, of a um, six boundary Euclidean instanton uh, in that exists in any number of dimensions. Um, you can have as many boundaries as you like, and you can find solutions that look like this, uh, where there's some matter uh, denoted by the red line here that goes across, uh, that connects the various boundaries. Okay, so you need the matter to support the wormhole, otherwise this won't be on shell. Um, and we studied a couple cases. One is where this is a thin shell of spherically symmetric matter. Then uh, you can find solutions like this by solving the, the Israel junction conditions. The same way you find like thin shell collapsing black holes, you can find thin shell wormholes. And the induced matter there, 
by lithium with energy conversion. Can you, can you just no, there's no, no, this doesn't need to violate any energy conversion. This ordinary positive mass. mass. Okay. It generates, it, yeah, yeah, just ordinary matter. Um, so you can find these by um, taking the ordinary thin shell black holes, sort of chopping them into pieces and, and, and gluing those pieces together um, and find some solutions. What is their CFT interpretation? Um, well, naively, instantons like this, uh, or these kinds of solutions would calculate, would contribute to ADS CFT calculations of something like uh, some operator V. So V here is an operator that, that creates a, a thin shell of matter. So V is like a black hole operator that creates this thin shell. And um, naively, these would these have the boundary conditions that would contribute to something like V dagger V to the kth power, which you can also write as trace rho to the K for rho being this state. Why but, wouldn't the handles, which don't change boundary conditions, not contribute just to Z itself and not, uh, no need to put insertions? Um, there are no solutions. If you don't put matter, then there are no solutions that look like this. The matter is necessary to support the wormhole. This can't be quite right because uh, this would lead to a factorization problem. These things are, this is just some number to the K. It can't have connected contributions. Um, but we made a general proposal for how to interpret these and checked it in some cases. The proposal is that what these wormholes really calculate um, is um, not trace of rho to the k, but trace of a coarse grain density matrix to the k. That there's a coarse graining going on. Um, and um, so this thing C is a coarse graining map. It takes a pure density, it takes a pure state density matrix and replaces it by a mixed state. Um, and we checked in, in the simple, we, we calculated this coarse graining map in the simplest cases and found that um, for these, some of these wormholes is really just a projection onto the diagonal in the energy basis. More generally, some complicated map that needs to be, uh, that needs to be found uh, using the bulk. It's hard to find, uh, but the general, but the, but the proposal is general. So uh, as far as original trace for the K goes, are you saying that those settled don't contribute, or there will be additional contributions which are still factorization. But, sec, yeah, that. But still, that some gross features of the answer are captured by. That's right. That, that's that's that's, it. It. that's the proposal. Yes, and that, that that's the proposal, and it passes various checks. I wouldn't say it's exactly derived from first principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to ask if, if, if whether the if whether the this channel should be acting on rho to the k, um, but I guess what's happening here is that c on rho. Rho is a pure state, but then C on rho is is a mixed state. So then the trace couples with two, couples with different density states. That's right. Which is together. That's right. If you like, you could think of this as the replica of the coarse grain state. Yeah. And so again, the C is outside the parentheses, so it's C of rho to the k. It's not no, it's C, no, C of rho all to the k. All to the k. C of first you coarse grain and then you raise it to the k. So this proposal generalizes uh, given talking to multi-boundary black holes, basically. If you just have one boundary, then this is like this is like um, given talking's Euclidean, Euclidean solutions. This is a proposal for multi-boundary black holes. It's quite general, it doesn't require averaging over theories. It works in any number of dimensions. It works in asymptotically ADS or in Minkowski. Um, and in particular, it applies to something like uh, four-dimensional gravity in asymptotically flat space, like the real world. Um, so for example, you can, in principle, um, use these gravitational instantons that I've described uh, to find gravitational vi uh, contributions that violate something like B minus L in the real world. Now, of course, we know that um, we know that in quantum gravity, global symmetries are supposed to be violated. Um, but 
for the most part, that was an indirect argument based on, on black hole evaporation. Here is a case where uh, you can just find the instanton and you can just calculate the contribution, contribution of that instanton to something like uh, a B minus L violating, uh, violating process. So what happens if there's if you find a drag and you bring cell evaluation, you don't use this instantons? Yeah, if, if you gauge B minus L, right. then uh, the wormholes don't exist. So you have to then you have to sum over fluxes inside the wormhole, and it can't it makes the wormholes not exist, and and everything is preserved. Now the proposal is not derived from first principles; it's checked in various examples, but um, has passed some tests. Is yeah, that, one, you know, question like you know the evil talking proposal when you just look at black hole in a gas case study. It's you know there's always this issue of having to subtract the action of some like reference space time that you choose. Because it works out, so I guess you still have kind of this kind, of, you know, this arbitrary arbitrariness in in doing the calculation if you were in flat space. Yeah, that's right. So the, you have all the usual issues of trying to do the the flat space Euclidean gravity calculations. I think if you, I mean the, okay, the the lore, and I'm not sure to what extent this has totally been shown, but the lore is that if you work in the microdynamical ensemble, then everything should be fine. But there are definitely technical issues with. Um, and with that, I will conclude. So uh, what's the message? Wormholes and other higher topologies make meaningful contributions to the gravitational path integral. Uh, now, I should emphasize that all these calculations on the gravity side that I'm doing are all calculations in the low energy theory. Uh, you know, in principle, they're supposed to match something in the UV, um, but they're calculations in the low energy effective theory and uh, the story that's emerging, both from this work and lots of other work by other people, is that higher topologies encode some coarse grain statistical data uh, about the UV field. Right. Thanks. So, in the first part of your talk, you uh, was it really necessary to have an average over? Theories, or could you also interpret your results as an uh, um, average of over, say, some microscopic state? In 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 two in that case, both uh, both work. So in two dimensional CFT, you can either use the coarse graining formalism, or you can do the average over theories. In higher dimensions, um, we don't know how to average over theories because we don't know how to impose impose crossing on an ensemble of higher dimensional CFTs. So in higher dimensions, only the coarse graining picture is available for now. Although I imagine that there's probably some average interpretation uh, also. So but don't you feel that this thing is a little bit of magic? Because, I mean, you have a, a path that leads from, say, wave functions to path integral to Euclidean path integral. But here instead you say that the path integral or semi-classical approximation of Euclidean path integral reproduces the average of CFT quantities over an ensemble that sort of satisfies the crossing equations, but not all, because actually the, the true set of conformative theories with the, the, the large gap and large C may even be N. So, I mean, it, it's, it's nice that it works, but I still have no idea why does it work, except that it does. <laughs> I, I I agree with that, except that I think it's a I think it's a level of of mystery that's similar to eigenstate thermalization. So in, in ETH, um, you kind of just you just write down some matrix elements in heavy states, and then just in, and you work in energy. It's work, important that you're in the energy basis. Okay, so the same thing here. It's important, like when I do the coarse graining channel, it depends that you're in the energy basis. Um, and then using Gaussian statistics in the energy basis is like the right is the right is the right way to, to reproduce the answer in quantum chaotic systems. Um, I don't. I, I also find that mysterious, but I think it's a similar level of it's a similar level of mystery, and and I think it's probably working for the same reason in both cases. To see, like so the D minus L violation story, how to see that it comes from kind of 
dynamics of the theory itself rather than from what caused by force graining? What caused yeah, you, you, you can't see it. You can't see it. Okay, so I think there's still a very important open question, which is are we really sure that the wormhole is calculating some kind of like typical contribution of a typical theory? Right. And, and I think we just don't know how to. Because it's also a tiny around. effect and can say, oh, factorization will be restored. But like about global symmetry violation, are we sure that it's not yet restored either? Or? I think we're not sure. I don't. I don't even. I don't know how. I don't know how we're supposed to. Other than finding UV complete theories and, and calculating things, I don't know how we're supposed to figure out if, if that's the correct typical answer or not. That would be a crucial question. But, yeah. Can I follow Massimo a little bit in the sense that give it general remark uh, from my experience. So many years ago, there was an issue, is confinement really consistent? Can you have confinement in a field theory? And people were saying, no, it's impossible. This, it's, it's not a good idea. And then people studied two-dimensional QCD, which had no photons, just like you have no gravitons. And they uh, did that, and they showed that it's consistent to have confinement. It doesn't violate any holy principle of quantum field theory, which people claimed at the time it was violated. So now, unless you tell me what lessons you have when you're propagating gravitons, I feel it's a statement that wormholes can make sense. You didn't discuss baby universes, but probably they can also be put in such a picture and then they make sense. But the, they, just like the mechanism of confinement in four dimensions had nothing to do with the born term, which was already confining in two dimension QCD, the rest, I don't know what to do with it in the sense of, I appreciate the miracles. A lot of nice things are happening, but I have no idea how much of this is really, can go on once you have real gravitons. And so I, when you I'm said- I'm not sure what is the sign of your comment. My sign of my in that case, is, the two, the two dimensional model did give the right answer. Apparently, it's, a, it's from a different effect. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Um, well, put it this way: I think we need to keep studying more models and 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 push to keep understanding wormholes and more models. Like it started mostly in two dimensions. And we've seen some similar things in, in three dimensions, less so, but um, okay. But three is still no gravitons. So the, the real challenge is to go to four. The last part of the talk was in four dimensions, so there are gravitons it was there. Much more conjecture. That's true. So, yeah. I mean, you need to start somewhere. So. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still learning to do things. But even in two dimensions, uh, how many examples we have? Of Theories that satisfy this the, uh, the requirement, large C and uh, large gap and sparse spectrum. So in, you're talking two, two both dimensions or two 2D CFT, you mean? 2D CFT. Zero. Zero. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there, there, are, there are examples that are essentially, well, if you add supersymmetry, then there are examples which are from string theory. Um, well, there is a conjecture, but there, there are none. But how, how many, how, how many, um, Quantum, how many chaotic quantum systems have been exactly solved? Like, how, how, many, how many times have people proved ETH? Zero, <laughs> right? Because it's the theories that, the interesting theories are the ones that you can't write down. And uh, yeah, so we should try to find them, but I don't think we should necessarily be bothered by the fact that we don't have examples. But at the same time, we think chaotic systems are generic. Right. So but we can't write down a single. We can't really write down a single one. I mean, we can write down the Hamiltonian quantum mechanics, but they're not. They're not. We can't solve them. Well, that's Sawas's definition of what generic. It's something for which there is no single example. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> but I mean, it may, it may be this case since there are also conjectures that say that there, that there are no conformal, no supersymmetric conformal theories with this property. Could one actually work? The other way, I'm trying to see if this method can show that there is something wrong with the uh, with, with non-supersymmetric theories with large gap and uh, 
that is, so not, well, the, part, of the, part of the motivation of this is exactly approaching that problem. Okay, so there are all these conjectures about what gravity can, can and cannot do, swampland, et cetera, and they all feel like questions that should, sh that should have something to do with the bootstrap, or not all of them. In many cases, it feels like the bootstrap would be a good way to, to address those questions. Um, but um, despite having many, many discussions about this, uh, like no, nobody can really find a way to form, nobody has found a good way to formulate it as a bootstrap problem. And I think the reason for that is that um, the bootstrap problem would have to involve black hole states in some essential way. So like any, any problem that can be bootstrapped without black hole states, or any bootstrap argument that doesn't involve black hole states, is unlikely to be able to prove or disprove any of the swamp line conjectures. And so we need to understand how to include the black hole states into the bootstrap. That was part of what, what, um, what we were trying to do. Um, at this point, it's just statistical, but maybe that's the first step. Actually, there is also one, and indeed, not only with the calculation, right? That was simply the partition function. So very simple conformal to be observable. But that, I don't, I don't know how to interpret it as an average, because besides, uh, if you try to interpret it as a conformal to theory, you get a continuous spectrum, fine, that you may get from averaging, but you also have negative norm contributions. And uh, yeah. uh, do you have a, a, is this something that we should just not think about right now, or there is a way of understanding the negative norm contributions to the partition function also in the language of average? So um, the, the first answer to your question is that those, so that involves effects that go beyond um, the leading semi-classical terms that I'm talking about. So that those effects come from summing over all the saddles. And what I'm talking about here is something that's true saddle by saddle. How to do the sum over all the saddles and like put that together into one final answer um, is a much harder, or it's a harder problem. And um, the second part of my answer is that I think it's very likely that off-shell topologies in the path integral um, are important at the same order as the sum over topologies. So that it probably doesn't make sense to just, well, based on what we've learned about JT gravity, I would guess that it doesn't make sense to just sum over the saddles and not include the off-shell topologies. There's this proposal of um, Maxfield and Teriyachi, which is a lot more detailed along those lines. Uh, but no, there's no direct calculation itself that, that gets rid of the, the, the non-unitarity. But uh, you can add this, uh, this, uh, this defect as to all the threshold and the other C yeah. in the paper from like, Alex and Nathan. Yeah, that's a that, different proposal. That also is not like a full-blown, it's, there's, there's no like full-blown proposal where you do a calculation and you get a unitary partition function. Yeah. yeah. They sort of showed that it, that it seemed to help. They showed that it helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not clear if there's no more negativity. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. when, when yeah. do you stop? Right? I mean, yeah. Now you allow some exactly. yeah, yeah. configuration. Now you have open above. It's like there's ways, there seem to be some ways of like improving it order by order high spin or something, yeah. but, when it, but the full story is still unknown. Questions? Thank you. Thank you.